Let's see. What I'm going to do is do a preamble first on what Tom talked about. Uh, because Tom said to me yesterday, he says, Mario, you don't even use your slides. <laughs> and I have them. They're all there. I promise you. Hopefully, I'll get through them. But sometimes I just start working, and boom, then I'm here. But I'm gonna, so I'm going to do a preamble because I want to cover some of the main points that the slides will cover if you see them. <laughs> now, you will have them uh, in the presentation. You know what I mean? You do that sometimes in the classroom? Never. Never? never? No. <laughs> so, so I want to do that preamble. One of the first things I want to do is I want to talk about that th our whole presentation is about development. Our students are in development. How many people that make sense to? Raise your hand. The people don't raise your hand. I'm going to come up and ask you why you haven't raised your hand. There you go, see? That's what you do in the classroom, because sometimes they don't raise their hand. Then you sit there and say, well, why didn't they raise their hand? So why didn't you raise your hand? Then, OK, good. Just like, the, just like the calculus one. That was interesting. People kept popping up. It was like popcorn, right? So we want to get participation in the classroom. But development, that is, all of our students are in development. And the development is cognitive. The development is behavioral, the development is emotional, OK? And the development happens where? In an environment. And so we can, this is the real beautiful thing of this, uh, where's, uh, I need a marker, there it is. We can operationalize development. And that's where I developed the 0 to 100% method, teaching learning, advising, counseling method to operationalize development for students and then for faculty and administrators. I was associate dean of San Francisco State of Undergraduate Studies, and I was on the executive committee at the faculty senate at the same time. I was an associate dean of undergraduate studies and on the executive committee of the faculty senate. I was chosen by the faculty. I'm proud of that. Um, the, uh, so we have to operationalize development. So what Tom is talking about today, you, how many of you heard some ideas that you said, wow, those are good ideas? How many of you heard that? Good. So you have to make them real, and that's what he talks about professional development. You have to make those ideas real, operationalize them, then measure them, right? And see how effective we are. It's sort of like SLOs. Although SLOs is kind of like, you know, wavering. <laughs> Um, OK, so we have to operationalize development. And the 0 to 100 operationalizes development. And that's going to be one of the main things I talk about. So now, besides operationalizing development, and I'm going to talk a little bit about faculty leadership, too. How many of you are interested in faculty leadership? Oh, I see more hands than that. OK, so let me get this. Let me get this page that I had here. This is not one of my slides, but this is one of the things that I wanted to do to sort of do the preamble. So the main points of my presentation, and you don't have to see this because I'll cover it, so that there are environmental cues in the classroom. We got it? Environmental cues. How many of you are familiar with, in, in the area of psychology, classical conditioning? Good. I love that. How many of you are not familiar? Raise your hand nice and high. Good. So then I want you to pay attention so you can learn. In, in, um, in um, memory, how many, how many of you have realized that as professors that memorization or using your memory is so huge in our classes? How many, and how many of you think that our students need to get better at that? OK, we have to, and not just memorize rote, but I'm talking about memorize to understand. Does that make sense? How many, yeah, OK, there, come on now, trust me. Uh, but you don't trust me just yet. That's OK, you got to. So here, what I was doing, I'm going to just show you memorization. When I was at Minnesota, little welfare kid, welfare. Little black kid from Oakland, although I'm Latino, light-skinned Latino, I'm a black kid from Oakland. What's that about? Um, so I'm getting ready to do my final orals, and I know that they're going to ask me about achievement motivation, right? Anybody done final orals here? Scary, huh? Scary? Raise your hand if it was scary. This was scary. This is PhD. In Ecuador, all the final exams were oral. Beautiful, good. Ecuador, como que bueno. 
Pero aquí en los Estados Unidos, no. No. Es PhD, we don't do that, but Ecuador. OK, I got to keep that in mind, Ecuador. So I knew that they were going to say, Mario, tell, give us a definition of motivation. So when I thought about that, I got so anxious. Anybody ever get anxious when you have to try? To, yes, good, I love that. What's your name? Jennifer. Jennifer, so you can you connect to that, I got huh? anxious when you called on me. Good. <laughs> oh, hold it. Now, did you, see, did you hear the laughter? Because that's the essence of my presentation, that Jennifer was powerful and to acknowledge that I got anxious when you called on me. It has to do with classical conditioning, too. And everybody laughed. Why? Because you felt it. Everybody get it? You felt, oh yeah, that's real. Don't come over to me. <laughs> Do our students like us to call on them? No. It reminds me of a joke, but I can't tell you that because it's a little bit, it's a little bit shady. No, you know that joke, Tommy, right? Okay. So um, there are environmental factors. There are cues that we have to become expert at realizing that they exist because those cues create fear. And that fear initiates a worry center in the brain. Anybody know what the worry center in the brain is? What is it? Oh, beautiful. The Say again. The amygdala. The amygdala. Beautiful. Big hand back there. <laughs> the, amygdala, the amygdala is the, the, the emotional center of the brain. And the amygdala focuses on what? Fight or flight, but because through evolution, our brain is wired, for, is like, um, uh, not Teflon, it's Teflon for like good, but it's Velcro for fear. Does that make sense? Why? Why is our brain wired to pay attention to fearful things? Somebody raise your hand. No, no, no. In the classroom, good, very good. <laughs> Survival. survival, adaptation and survival. So our students are wired for fear. Does that make sense? And our schools are fear factories. <laughs> uh, how many people have heard that before? In elementary school, when a child makes a mistake, and I do this, you're hearing how I talk to students in the first days of class to try to connect with them. Our schools are fear factories where we learn to compare and despair. In a child in elementary school, when he or she makes a mistake, what do the other kids do? Wow. Come on, a little bit stronger. What do the other kids do? Wow. And how does that child feel? Embarrassed. Embarrassed? Vergüenza en español. Vergüenza is a huge word in español. How many people know vergüenza? That's one of the things you want to learn today. Let me write it down. Vergüenza, I like that. That's a learning thing. Vergüenza. Because if you tell a Latino, Chicano, Latina, I know a little bit about vergüenza, what are they going to do? What's that? Sorry? <laughs> I like it. There's the attention thing no, no, no. in the classroom, right? There's the attention thing. And so then you go up there and rub them and say, what you rubbing me for, boy? <laughs> when you tell a Latino, Chicano Latino student, I know a little bit about vergüenza. What are they going to feel towards you? Maybe. Yeah, they're going to feel like, uh, you know, that you understand them. Good, that you understand. How many people got that? Mm -hmm. So vergüenza. Vergüenza means embarrassment and shame. Mm -hmm. shame. Avergonzado. I was raised with vergüenza, man. I was raised with vergüenza. I'm doing Latino brothers and sisters for you. A little black ex accent, North Oakland. <laughs> you like that one? Okay. But listen, you got that, that look. It's good. So I look and I say, you were a little confused with that? Well, go ahead. I'm just going to let that one go. <laughs> she go I'm going to let it go. So yeah. here's, here's Gestalt. I'm going to let that one go. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to push you down, but I'm going to let it go. There's nonverbals that we yeah. do with students, yeah. but there's a goodness in me. Now, zero to 100, what is your name? It's Kathleen. Kathleen, zero to 100, how connected do you feel with me? Zero is no connection at all, 100, perfect. Honestly, just like. How much 100%. can I? You do? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. I was confused, but now I. I 
Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. I didn't say anything when he gave me a talk. Okay, but thank you. So, vergüenza is embarrassment, okay? So, when we become knowledgeable about our students and we can share that knowledge, they feel connected to. How many people get that? Well, zero to 100, you have to ask yourself, how well do I know Chicano Latino students, their language, their culture, their learning styles, their fears around learning, that I can connect with them? How many people got this? Zero to 100, you can ask yourself that. Who's at 100 here and really understanding Chicano Latino students, or even the word Chicano? <laughs> how many people, you know the word, but okay, but see, how many people know the history of Chicanos in the United States? Beautiful. Well, what I'm saying, raise your hand, because this is big right here. This is the faculty of Moore Park College, and you've got 31% Latino, Chicano Latino here. And if you don't know, and if you get a person who's Chicano, now, if then you learn about Chicanos, but the person says, well, I'm Mexicano. Yo soy mexicana, o yo soy ecuadoreño. Ecuatoriano. <laughs> See, and you can make the correction, <laughs> like you like that one. So, o costaricense, tico, soy tico. You know, you've got to know them to connect to them. But this is not simple, just, oh, I know a little bit about them. This is you being committed as a faculty member, faculty senate president. This is no different than I talk to our faculty or any other faculty. You have to be committed to being professional at what you do, which means knowing your students. How many people get that? Beautiful. Foster youth, same thing. Veterans, same thing. So Tom's, and you see how it's professional development? It takes time. But if Moore Park College says, we are going to develop these knowledge, this knowledge base in our populations, then we are going to be skillful. Are we going to be more effective at retaining and graduating? Are we? Yes or no? A little bit louder. Yes. Good. Lights went out. Not too loud now. We don't want to darken the place totally. <laughs> Environmental cues in classical conditioning. This was in a class. This happened about three semesters ago. I had a, you know, Maria, uh, tell me about, uh, give me the definition of the biological approach in psychology. And then, then I called on her, and she said, Oh, I knew it, I studied it, but when I heard, when you called my name, you got it? When you called my name, I forgot it. Everybody got it? Mm -hmm. Her name has no, is no longer a neutral stimulus or a conditioned stimulus for joy, it's a conditioned stimulus for what? Fear. Her name in the classroom. So we want to stop using her name in the classroom? Yeah. No. We have to become competent of how to use her name and go through that fear. How many people get that? <laughs> Zero to 100. How effective are you to go through that fear with students? You have to be honestly task involved with yourself and say, and how many people want to be committed to becoming competent at that level? Beautiful. That's, I love that. We should get a photograph of that one. <laughs> Moore Park College, commitment to excellence. That's what it is. It's developing a sense of um, the zero to 100 that we are going to develop the competency to be effective practitioners with our students. Cognitive factors. How many people are familiar with the PEG method of memory? Good. Two or three. So. Now, memorization, oh, and I want to go back to my PhD. So when I sat down, thank you. Don't let me forget sometimes. Sometimes I will forget. Most, not, not too often. But I, I went into the, uh, the final oral, and the first question they said, Mario, give us a definition of motivation. Now, what had I done? Memorized it. Meaning and organization. Memorization is organization. But meaning making is understanding it. Motivation is all the factors that influence the direction, strength, and persistence of behavior towards a goal. How many people like that? Motivation is all the factors that influence the direction, strength, and persistence of behavior towards a goal. How many people can, can like that definition? 
So in the final oral, they said, oh, Mario, and they took out their pens, three of the five PhDs, said, could you please repeat that? And I said, well, I got it now. <laughs> now, when I taught social psychology at Cal State East Bay, that's what I first did. I taught social psych, abnormal psych, intro psych, and I would go up to students and say, what are you teaching Dr. Rivas next semester? And I said, social, uh, social psych, I already had it. Have you ever heard this before? I already had that. And then you ask them, well, what did you learn? Okay, good, tell me, good, let me get the reaction there from somebody. What is the kind of like the thing we don't want to hear? I can't remember. Okay, see, and in the classroom you want to watch that, so you have a classroom management, right? So raise your hand so I can get somebody to get a clear statement. Somebody, what do we want to hear? Now then the hands don't go up. What's going on there? So, what did you say? So, uh, I don't remember. I don't remember, okay. So they said, I already had that. I said, what grade did you get, B? Okay, A, C's make me seasick. You have to be somebody, a person. So that's the mentality that I use as a professor. C's are good. I mean, you know, it's okay to get a C if you're trying and learning, right? And you're developing, does that make sense? But you wanna go for that B and that A, but meaning, SLOs, I mean, it's really understanding. So. So then when I taught social psych, what I did is this. The first day, the definition. Anybody know the definition of social psych? Do we know the psychologist in the room? Ooh, I'll put a little stress on you. <laughs> no, okay. Back row. Back, okay, so it, very good. Do any of the psychologists know that? So, here, now listen, this is, this is, listen, listen to me. You're going to hear the teaching spot for me to get the, I'm giving a preamble. This is a teaching spot. I'm putting the psychology professors on the spot. <laughs> to demean them, <laughs> to demean them, everybody says, hell yeah, what the hell are you doing back here? <laughs> Leave them psychology professors alone because you pretty soon are gonna come over to my discipline. <laughs> Communications. <laughs> Okay, psychology professor, social psychology, definition. Okay, what is your first day? First day, what's your name? Veronique. Veronique, I love it, Veronique. I'm not gonna call you up, but I could bring Veronique up, and I do that to students in the classroom after I've assigned them a reading, because I want them to know that I'm serious about them learning. So Veronique, please come up. No, no, I'm not asking you. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying after, because it was, come, 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 what was, Chacome was saying that she did all this work with these Latino students, or these students around biology, but, and she told them there was gonna be on the test, and she gave the test, and they still didn't do it. How many times have I ever experienced that? There you go, that, there it is, Tom, you see it? This is the challenge. Okay, so when I taught it, I said, okay, I know about memorization and meaning, meaning and organization. Social psychology is the discipline. So do they understand what discipline means? No, you gotta go over it. This is the truth about the classroom, our classroom. I was at Minnesota, I was the assistant director of the Martin Luther King Leadership and Advising Program, and we had tutors and we had students go into classes. How are you doing? <laughs> Name? Robert. Robert. It's always good to look at faces and say, what's going on here? Because actually, because actually, I was looking at you and I was looking and I said, I, I, I think I shared with, who did I share with? I can't remember who I shared with. That there weren't a lot of head nodding or moving during Tom's presentation. So I'm saying, what is that about? Some people said, mm hmm. We were transfixed. Tra oh, beautiful. I love it. Transfixed. I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. But yeah, so, so we don't know. And in the brain, something is going on, and in the body, something going on, right? And it is our job to connect. And eyes are the windows of the soul, right? That's right. And what in our brain connects to the eyes in the temporal lobe? Psychologists again or biologists? <laughs> Anybody? Go ahead. No, uh, Veronique? Optic nerve. Yeah. No, not in the temporal lobe. The optic nerve is like in the, uh, it's not in the temporal lobe. But, the, but good try though. It's in the, <laughs> the, 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 what, the mirror neurons. How many people have heard of mirror neurons? 
Okay, good. So you see how I'm just like running through stuff? But I want to, and Tom want to come back so we can do more thorough workshops so you understand mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are copy neurons, and they're in the brain, and they work automatically. However, here's my hypothesis, and I haven't done that research, <laughs> but maybe somebody here could do it, and more part could do it, is that most, many, if not most of our students have, and in fact, there's a relationship, there's a connection here, autistic people with autism have a dearth of mirror neurons. Their mirror neurons aren't functioning, so they can't copy well. Our students have disconnected their mirror neurons. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they can't monitor us as effectively as they can, and we have to whoo, fire up the mirror neurons, does that make sense? To really make them work more, to, to make them copy, yes. Why? Because. Why this particular group of students, though? I guess is my All opinion. students, I didn't say, oh, okay. I said all you students. You said our students. <laughs> well, I mean, all of our community college students. Community college students. But why? Why this pop? Like, why the community college population? Is because that's where we're teaching. I mean, if I was at San Francisco State, I'd be talking about State University. All students, all students okay. need to do that. Yeah. So I'm sorry, but that for clarification's sake. So, yes, it's all students. But I'm talking about in community college more so because I think at the UCs the mirror neurons are firing more, and they're copying and they're picking up. And so we'll see about mirror neurons, but they're my ability to be empathetic. Beautiful, I love it, see? Now I'm seeing it. Just, I'm seeing it more. Very good. Very good, I'm seeing it. You see in the classroom, you can't sit up here. And I was on, I'm on different TRCs, and I've seen professors sit up here and lecture. The mirror neuron, I don't know what the mirror neurons of the students are doing, but the brain is not wor working, but as, as powerfully. Now let's go back to social psych. Social psych is the discipline that uses a scientific method to understand and explain how the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of individuals are influenced by the real, imagined, implied presence of others. Pretty good? Mm -hmm. Proxemics, conformity, attraction theory, every week, they learned that in the first week. They learned that definition. Proxemics, how does that relate to the definition? Conformity, how does that relate to the definition? Attraction theory, does everybody get it? No, I'm not just saying memorization. In fact, I feel a little bit affronted that people would even look at me like that. I'm one of you. I've been trained and I'm educated. Meaning making is what we want our students to do, not just to memorize stuff, but they have to memorize our students, community college students, students of color, underprepared students especially, have to develop that power. And that's one of the strategies, that's the PEG myth of memory. So PEG, mnemonic. Anybody know where the word mnemonic comes from? See, this is, this is not necessarily what you need to know, but it's powerful because you tell students, Nemos was the Greek god of memory. That's where the word mnemonic comes from. Interesting? <laughs> Is that, yeah, see, I like that. You see the heads go up? That's meaning making and that's connection in the classroom. Now, social psychology, but you can't just give them the definition. You've got to keep hitting it over and over. It's again, was it? Chacomet. Chacomet, I have to remember, Chacomet. You have to do, oh, everybody got that? We got to keep repeating it, repeating it. And eventually, here's my hypothesis again. They have a learning experience that, boom, kicks them in, and then they're gone mm -hmm. as learners. That, who said, mm-hmm? OK, come on up here. <laughs> OK, good. See, here, I do this in the classroom. This is now the learning spot. Look at who she gave me a nice big hug. That feels good. I'm in theater. Oh, you're in theater. <laughs> Who's not in theater out there? What do we want? Who, who do we want to get this not in theater to come up here? <laughs> that communication. Okay, so you said, no, no, no. So you said, mm. tell us why you said, mm. it you just It makes perfect sense to me. That's what how makes, I learn and how I think. And what, yeah. but, but tell them what makes perfect sense. To, well, explain what you said again, and I will tell you. What, <laughs> what do you think I'm trying to do? I'm trying to remember what I said. <laughs> Who remembers what I said? Okay, good. Thank you, Chocomet. You just said that you repeat and repeat, and then you learn, and then you learn. 
And then all of yeah, a sudden. Really, yeah, yeah and, all of, and all of a sudden, okay, so tell them, yeah, here, take this, tell me your name. No, Halle. <laughs> Halle? Yeah. Okay, tell them. So, well, so paraphrase. Okay, so I think we repeat and repeat and repeat, and I think in my mind, I feel like, oh, I keep repeating the same thing. Yes. But then eventually, you see that light go off, you see the light in your yes. eyes, and they get it, and then the information just pours Good. out of them. The light is the mirror neurons, but yeah. it's also the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> what he said. The, the, uh, the, is it the singular gyrus? Who's, who's, uh, you see, that's cognitive neuroscience. There's something going on in the brain, and what we want to do is fire up the brain. Was it Holly? Holly? Holly. Holly. Like hallelujah without the lujah. Okay, Holly. Holly. <laughs> big hand for big big hand for Holly. <laughs> you see how the environment you see how the environment in the classroom changes and it becomes more active by just bringing people up because say, oh, oh, that could be me. <laughs> yeah, I like that smile. I saw it. <laughs> yes, who me? Because students will say, who me? So that's part of being in the classroom. That's, and so, they, okay, so cognitive factors. Cognitive factors are the way we think and how we process information. There's behavioral factors. Who's familiar with slant? Slant, okay, inner city. So this is the knowledge. This is professional development. You got me? Oh, I don't, you feel me? Yeah, I don't even want to make ugly faces, almost getting into my father. Um, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Oh, you know what it is? No, I was just clarifying, was that word S-L-A-N-G, slant? Slant. Yes, I'm sorry, you can't see it. Slant, S-L-A-N-T, very good. Thank you, for, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Tell me your name. Welcome. I'm an interloper from Ventura College. <laughs> What's your name, though? Anna, Anna Carlson. Anna Carlson. Thank you, Anna, for from Ventura. Absolutely. Come on, bigger hand than that. What did Anna do? She's she's asking for clarification in the classroom, right? How many of our students don't do that? A lot. Yeah, but who who creates the environment for them to do that? Zero to 100, how effective are you as individual faculty members and disciplines, SLO related, in creating that environment in the classroom? Because that environment is correlated with student success. Make sense? So everybody get what I'm doing here, I'm modeling? Okay. Um, slant, sit up, listen, attend, nod, and track. Inner city kids, they knew and they told, they told them this in, in uh, special, in, not spe in programs, leadership programs, not special programs, leadership programs, as Tom said, one out of 10. These are leadership programs. Sit up, listen, attend, nod, and track. That raised grade performance and learning. Do our students sit up, listen, attend, nod, and track? <laughs> Do they need to get better at it? Yes. Oh, yes. Our students, is that okay? That's a little Huh? That's a listening model. Well, that's probably where they got it. Yeah. Good. Sorry. Very good. Name again? No. <laughs> no? Is that NGO? NOH. 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 Oh, sorry. Yes, that is a listening model. I'm, bl I'm blushing. Anybody can see me blushing just a little bit? Yeah. So there's some bed grants are going in there. I don't know what it's about, but I'll go. Uh, okay, yes, it is a listening model, but slant. The key thing is, I do that in the classroom. I come on now, and I teach them about slant, and I say, come on, little, sit up, come on, come on, come on, be with me. Now, is that good? You look at my ratings, and I haven't looked at them, I was telling Tom, look at my student ratings. They always tell me, Dr. Reed, man, your student ratings are high. And they said, he really changed my life. So I'm not saying it for me, I'm saying it for you. I'm at the point in my life, on September 28th, I had an operation to put in a stent in my uh, ventral medial artery. Man, I don't know where I am. As Tom says, we're in the last quarter, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, but here's the key thing. A lot of you are not in the last quarter, so take what we're saying to heart. Beautiful, I love it. Name? Me? Yes, me. Why do people say me? <laughs> yes, what's your name? Ruth. Ruth, come up here, Ruth. Come up here. Yeah. Yeah, bigger hand than that. I know. What's your name? Christina. 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 Christina's saying, damn, 
He's coming to me. Yes, I am coming to you, Christine. <laughs> do you see what's happening now? Are students paying more attention? That's what you want to do, is you want to create more attention. In, in, in learning, in, in uh, how many, how many, Ruth, right? Yes. Okay, before I forget, what is it? Oh, what is it? <laughs> okay, Ruth, <laughs> don't nod. Why not? So why did you nod? Why did you nod? Why did you really um, uh, connect with that, with your copy neurons? I can't remember. I know. Show that some I. neurons aren't functioning very well this morning. No, that's not it. Who can bring us back in what we were talking about? Slant. Slant and track. And yes. you're saying we want to teach that in the classroom and we want to have students be effective. And we, as faculty members, faculty, academic center president. Don't you think I became academic center president by chance? I had to be, first of all, and in a Black Panther college. <laughs> And was, was by the African-American faculty say, Mario, you be the Senate president. So you know I must be doing something right. Is that right? Yep. So I'm just saying that about me. I'm talking about you, faculty leadership. So slant is important, and it's important for us as faculty to really teach in the classroom those behavior strategies, those personality strategies. Do you agree with that? Yes. I do. So tell them why because we need our students to be engaged, and engaged includes sitting up and listening, paying attention. Good, and, and now. Nodding. Ruth, good, nodding. And and can, can I do that, can I, and tracking? Oh, you can Is do that. Is that okay, too. good? He initiated um, the contact. He, I initiated the contact. <laughs> <laughs> She's enjoying it, but I initiated it. Um, I'm on the tenure track, I have to be careful. Oh, she's on tenure track. <laughs> and there's another thing. I hate how tenure track faculty are treated. Come on now. Too often times it's kind of like, it's kind of like you're here, you know, and you got to do well. We got to love anybody who's hired here and work with them and support them. They do here. Beautiful. Good. Big hand then for more part. Yeah. Big hand. Good. Thank you. So, so Ruth, zero to 100, where are you in being effective in the classroom? in creating that attention by challenging, supporting, loving students, by really getting them to do that. Zero to 100, where are you? I'd like to think I'm around 80%. Very good, big hand. Beautiful. OK, good, very good, she's higher, that's good. How many people need to improve in that area? Good, uh-huh. Who's like around 50? Beautiful, come on up here. Oh. Thank you, Ruth, yes. Come on up here, 50. So here, everybody understanding the zero to 100% method? How many people are sort of getting an idea of what the zero to 100% teaching, advising, learning method is? How many people sort of are getting the idea? How many people are not getting it? Okay, well how many people just are not gonna raise their hands? <laughs> That's the most people. Hello. Okay, hi. So your name? My name is Johanna. And you teach what area? Child development. Child development. That's huge That's area. That's where all right the there. action happens. So, yes. <laughs> so, zero to 100. Christine Olson, she's our main faculty development uh, okay. in child development at Merritt. Um, so, where are you in that ability to really challenge, support students to, to slant, to really pay attention and be engaged? I think I'm fairly high up. Oh, I thought I said who was at fifty. I thought you said you were at fifty. No, I think I'm I'm fair. I'm higher up. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, big hand. Okay, but the key. Okay, so what we have to look at is that zero to hundred percent uh, method and purposeful behavior is Albert Bandura, social psychology, um, developed a method self-efficacy. How many people heard of self-efficacy? the social cognitive theory of learning. And he said purposeful behavior is the most powerful vehicle to get people to change their personalities. How many of us realize that we're changing a lot of our, supporting our students to change their personalities? We are. And it's one of the, Carl Rogers, how many people are familiar with Carl Rogers? Said that personality change is resisted. It's difficult to do because it's scary, especially if I'm filled with vergüenza. Mm -hmm. 
You got me? If I'm filled with shame, and I'm telling you, I'm gonna, now I'm going to get into my shame, but let me do biopsychosocial factors. How many people know that as far as having a goal, so how many people, when you're teaching in your classroom, want your students to have goals of excellence? Good. And when people achieve their goals, they release dopamine. How many people are familiar with that? Dopamine is a feel-good neurotransmitter, right, in the brain. Whoa, man. We release more dopamine if we think we're going to achieve the goal than after we've achieved the goal. Everybody got that? So my perception, my thinking of myself, I can achieve the goal. That means I can get an A in this class. I can learn. More dopamine is released and glutamate. And what does that do to the brain? Energizes it. Who said that? Energize it, right? And, it, and then the brain is more ready to pay attention. If I don't think I can achieve the goal, there's attribution theory, there's stereotype threat, then the brain is not doing that. The worry circuit is being amplified. So what's happening in our classrooms is our students have more worry circuit going than reasoning circuit and the reward pleasure center. How many people get that? Raise your hand. So we have to create environments to really empower them to think that they're going to achieve their goal. There's chocolate man. Well, I've got to get that. OK, chocolate, chocolate man. Um, and we'll be able to see it. Look at chocolate man, the way she's sitting. Look at the way she's sitting. No, no, no. It's, she's leaning forward. She's smiling. Is that the way we want our students to sit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when they're not sitting like that, what do we do? Too many of us retreat to the podium. We've got to go out to them, love them, challenge them. That can be operationalized how you do that. We want them to release dopamine. How many people have heard of Amy Cuddy? Good. OK, let me get somebody. OK, good. OK, somebody else. Let me go to the back. Amy Cuddy? Amy Cuddy? OK, what research? Did you know about her research? I do. I know about, about presence. And what? Her book, Presence. Beautiful. OK, come on up. Oh. <laughs> you like that? Look at all the smiles. What's her name? I'm going to take my power posing. Beautiful. Well, tell them. Yeah, good. So tell me your name. Jane. Jane? OK, so Jane. Jane is going to teach you about Amy, Amy Cuddy. And uh, she does a talk on where? On uh, TED Talks. TED Talks. Uh, yeah. How many how many people are going to pay watch TED Talks and Amy Cuddy this weekend? <laughs> Good. So twenty tell, minutes will change your life. Oh, listen to this. So if twenty minutes will change our life, what is it going to do for our students? And why aren't we doing it in the classroom? And that's not. I'm not. Oh, I've shown it to my students. I'm not. You, you have shown. Tell them about it. Then. Tell them oh. about. It. Tell them about them. Con convince okay. them to show it to their students. You have to show this video to your students. Amy Cuddy is a social psychologist. I think she's a. Princeton or Harvard? Um, I don't remember. Is it Harvard? Thank you. And uh, she did research on body language and how our body language changes ourselves, not how it changes others. We already know a lot about that. And she did a very simple test. Um, swab, do your power posing, two minutes, or powerless posing, swab, and see if people wanted a gamble. And um, yeah, roll some dice. Um, and what she found is that people who did power posing for two minutes, their cortisol levels went down, Beautiful. and their testosterone levels went up, and they felt more confident in themselves. Um, and so I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm new here. Next week Six I celebrate months. Six, Six months. Oh, beautiful. Big hand, come on. <laughs> yes. What area, what area are you teaching? I'm not. I'm a dean now. Oh, beautiful dean. That's even, no wonder people did. That come on, big hand for a dean. <laughs> okay, go ahead. And I was very nervous before the interviews. Imagine that. And so I went into the bathroom and I did my power posing for two minutes before <laughs> each of my interviews. And now I'm here. And very happy to be here. So, very good. So, tell me your name again one more time. Jane. Jane, good. So Amy Cuddy, basically this is that, so I want everybody to get up. We can do this in the classroom. I do this in the classroom with my student. Everybody get up and just put, put like this and do it like this. 
How many of you, and you can't raise your hand, just say yes. How many of you feel a little bit more powerful by doing this? Yes, good. Okay, all right, good. Thank you, sit down. Now, and hey, listen, very good, very good. Now, down. Down, class, down. You said two minutes. I know. Well, here, she did two minutes. She also did like this. She put a pencil in people's mouth like this, and that raised testosterone level. So how many of our students are sitting in the class like this, not with pencils, smiling, and how many of them are sitting up in power poses? Or how many of them are, are like this? She said mo women, more than men, sit like this. This is a cortisol pose. Cortisol affects your hippocampus, which affects your memory. How many of you didn't know that? So we want to create our environment in the classroom so they're releasing dopamine and glutamate and the positive neurotransmitters. And cortisol is a hormone. So releasing, not releasing cortisol. Stereotype threat releases what? Cortisol. Got me? Negative attributions release cortisol. Positive attributions, testosterone. Testosterone is a confidence hormone. It makes you feel more confident. So read Amy Cuddy. But now we have to operationalize that. How are we at Moore Park going to get all the faculty to really start doing this in the classroom by operationalizing how to make this happen? OK, now let's go into the, now did I take that time? Yeah, I'm like, there it is. OK, good. Now we'll get into the presentation. Oh, no, faculty leadership. Let me tell you faculty leadership. The, I'm, I'm co-chairing the District Education Committee. I'm on the District Academic Senate at Peralta. In the District Academic Senate, and in the, let's go back to the DAS. The, this is faculty leadership. Remember what Tom said? He said, moving in, who remembers that? Okay, <laughs> I love it. Moving in, who doesn't remember? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, come on. Okay, so, so. Okay, what did Tom say? Okay, so who doesn't, who doesn't remember what Tom said about moving in and et cetera? Moving in? I don't remember the moving in part. Okay, okay, moving in, moving through, moving on. That's what the research says our students do. Like that? So I took that knowledge from our article at the District Academic Senate, challenged the district administration with the District Ac uh, Academic Senate Faculty, we have to take leadership in making the environments powerful. And we said, we want to look at all the money coming in, equity, foster youth, veterans, um, uh, um, triple SP. We want to take all that money, and we want to make sure that we're covering the important bases in moving in, moving through, and moving on. How many people get that? Is that powerful? Faculty. Now, here's moving in. At the District Education Committee, we did the zero to 100 with moving in. Orientation, and the big one was early alert. How many people have heard of early alert? Yes. So we did a zero to 100 assessment at the District Education Committee in our four colleges, how well we were doing with early alert. And the rating was 4.3, not 43, 4.3. And they said, where do we want to get to 50? So now we have to operationalize how we're going to move up as a district for colleges to do early alert more effectively. How many, how many people get that? Raise your hand, please. Raise your hand. OK, you see that? That's faculty leadership. Where am I? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> so zero. Yeah, yeah. Zero to 100. I have, you know, being Senate president, I haven't been doing talks like for the last year and a half. You know, after I get out of the Senate president, I'll probably do it again. Tom and I have got some ideas. Uh, one of my own ideas is that we have to develop a community college certificate. And there's the college down here on teaching in community colleges. How many people think that would be a good idea? Yes. You've been through it. And it's online, right? Beautiful. Well, you can develop one here and get FTES and educate 
the faculty to become more effective with all these theories and how to apply them. How many does that sound good? Okay, so let me show you now. This book at Merritt, we had, we had a, this, this book at Merritt, How Learning Works, we had a faculty reading group. I'll just pass it around so people can look at it, but this is How Learning Works. It's beautiful, seven principles for effective teaching based in research. Anybody read it? Beautiful. This could be used in the course, course, this could be used in the departments, but if you choose to become more effective with your students, this is the sort of reading you want to do. Here's another one, transforming your teaching by the use of cognitive neuroscience teaching strategies. Okay, good, sound good? But we have to be committed to it, and this is part of professional development. Here's another beautiful book. How many people have seen this book? This is, yeah, you like it? You just bought it, who's read it? Okay, why did you buy it? I read a little about it, it's really interesting. Yeah, this is a beautiful book that I use in one of my psychology classes, it's called Buddha's Brain, and it's, it's the practical neuroscience of Buddha's brain, happiness, love, and wisdom. But I use it because they have strong intentions, how to increase your motivation, um, taking in the good, how to make your brain be focused on positive rather than negative. Very, very, very powerful book. But we could read this here, and then we could give this knowledge either in orientation or in workshops for students because we want to empower students to be more effective people in their lives. Okay. So now, where is that little thing again, Tom? There it is. Okay, so now let me sit there. And now, okay, is it this way? Good. Course pre-assessment survey, I do that with students because I want to get a sense for what, they're no what they do know but I want to ask you, just as again an example in teaching, how many of you, zero to 100, how, how familiar are you with cognitive attribution theory with respect to learning? Zero to 100, who is at 80? Cognitive attribution theory and learn. Okay, who's at around 20? Okay, good, that's good. Raise your hand, that's a tall, high. I'm not gonna call on you, I promise you. There you go. So, do you see, okay, that's good. Now, stereotype threat, aha. Who is pretty knowledgeable on stereotype threat and is around 80? Peter. Okay, good. Who needs to learn more about stereotype threat? Raise your hand. There it is, that's professional development. You have to now prioritize what you wanna do. Um, mnemonics and use of the PEG method. How many people are familiar with the PEG method? Just, okay, so let me just do the peg method. Give me 10 things, but don't make them too weird. For go, how many of you go shopping at the supermarket and you sort of say, okay, I'm, oh, I forgot three things. Anybody ever, has that happened to you? You go and you forget, okay, so I want you to give me a list of 10 items. Just like, call them out, but slowly. Name one. Bananas. Bananas, okay, but let me take time so I can use the peg method. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, milk. Milk. Coffee. Wait, wait, slow down. <laughs> uh, please. Um, milk, right? Okay. Uh, good. Oh, good. And then coffee? Um, hold it. Okay, got you. Okay, coffee? Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, next one? Airbus A380s. What's that? Airbus A380. Okay, that's a little bit too complex for me just to even hear it. What is it? Cat food. Cat food. Okay. So, okay, you got cat food, okay. So let me back up now. Um, milk. Uh, coffee. No, no, coffee was three. Um, bananas, slow down, bananas, and then um, cat food. Right? So give me another one. Toothpaste. Toothpaste. So, ugh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, toothpaste. Okay, give me another one. Anything. Bread. Bread. Okay. All right. So, um, 
Good Lord, now I'm getting stressed. Okay, here's the worry circuit working. Because I did this with Tom last night, no problem, right? But the worry circuit in front of you affects me. So bread was, I mean, bread was the last one. Um, toothpaste was the one before that. Cat food was one before that. You see, now I've lessened the worry circuit. I've calmed myself down. This is what happens. Um, three is tree. So here, let me tell you how it works. One is sun, two is shoe. It's a number word rhyme. And then you associate a visual to it about what you're trying to remember. One is sun. Everybody got it? Two is shoe. You see the visual? Three is tree. Four is door. Five is hive, six is sticks. It's, we're just choosing the words that, that rhyme. Seven is heaven, eight is skate, nine is spine, 10 is hen, okay? So one was what? Sun. Sun. Two was shoe. shoe. Three is tree. tree. Four is door. Five is hive. That was the toothpaste. And what I visualized was toothpaste coming out of a beehive. <laughs> Isn't that good? So anyway, you can teach students to use this PEG method, and that's what I did on my finals. I wish I could show you the finals. I was so happy that they, that the uh, five main approaches that psychologists use to understand, explain, control, and predict mental processes and behavior, the biological approach, the cognitive, the behavioral approach, the psychoanalytic approach, the humanistic approach. They have visuals for them, and they remembered them, and I said, whoa. Now, I'm mentoring students to go into psychology. Does that make sense? They can talk about stuff now. But they're using the PEG method, okay? So let's go back. Bread was six, and we can go on. Then uh, uh, toothpaste, cat food. Now, I know milk was in there, but um, why I got stuck on the, oh, and the, the stuck on the first three because of the worry circuit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It was more, you see how the more recent stuff, I calmed the worry circuit down. How many people are getting that? So if we become powerful with the PEG method, the low, low side method, how much of our brain is devoted to visuals? How much of our brain? Yeah, more than a lot. Um, let's get more than a lot. Any, any specifics, <laughs> biology or uh, cognitive neuroscientists? One quarter of our brain, the occipital lobe, is devoted to pictures. It's only the last 2,000 words that word, last 2,000 years that words have come into play. So we want to give students pictures and use pictures to become powerful learners. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The humanistic approach, that's an individual pointing, emphasizes that each person is free to choose his or her future, pointing. And they've got breaking chains, that's a picture has a large capacity for personal growth that's a big bag with PG on it. How many people are getting the idea? Mm -hmm. So then next year when somebody said, well, what is the humanistic approach? They can remember it. How many, how many of you think that this is some pretty powerful stuff to help our students be powerful learners? Raise your hand. Good, I'm glad I'm making that point. Okay, so now. Theory is the net we weave to catch the meaning of experience. I'm just gonna go through this. This is all theory stuff. But theory is powerful. So we want to become, Moore Park wants to become a powerful, theoretically based college vis-a-vis -vis student learning. Uses, applies theory to make learning more effective. Does that, that make sense? Okay. Okay, learning which involves change in self-organization in the perception of oneself is threatening. It's difficult. My students come into my class and they said, I can't learn that way with pictures. I know a quarter of their brain, you know, so I've got to now not give up on them. Um, Chaco Med, I can't give up on them. And I've got to figure out different ways of getting to them. You, you like that? Tell me, I'm enjoying you back there. Tell me your name. Sandy. Sandy's like rocking with me, huh? Beautiful. She's releasing that dopamine back there. Um, we are all meaning makers. This is Keegan, and Tom has introduced immunity to change as far as professional development. Tom and I do a real deep thing. How many times do we set goals for ourselves and we don't do them? And students, how many times do they do that? Immunity to change, Keegan's book, Immunity to Change, defines why that happens and how to change that. So we as faculty members, 
can learn to set goals for ourselves and really achieve them. We as a con collective faculty group can set goals. One of the big things as far as equity funds, classroom mentors. I know that I know, and I'm doing this next semester, that if I get a classroom learning mentor for my students, I'm going to lose fewer students. And I keep a lot, but I lose too many African American students and I lose too many Latino students. How many people can relate to that one? So I want a classroom mentor, learning mentor, who connects to those students and is an extension of me. And I want to use equity funds for that. How many people think that's a good idea? But we has, at the faculty, we have to be there at the table to really ask for that and, and say, this is going to work, and then measure it. So we are all meaning makers, and when we make meaning, we experience hope. When we don't make meaning, we lose hope. We are a composition. Meaning and understanding, not memorization, creates hope. Everybody got that? That's our big brain. What we do with meaning is organize it. Perception is organized sensation. Conception is organized perception. Knowledge is organized conception. And wisdom is knowing what to do next. But do you hear organization in there? How many people see it? Any questions on that? Is it, is it clear, fairly clear? Yes, or let me see a show of hands if it's fairly clear. The more we organize, the more we become clear at, as to what we're learning. Now, that means we have to have organization strategies in our classroom. One of the things in um, Ellen Gagné's book, The Cognitive Psychology of School Learning, she, she has one on the sciences, math, English, et cetera, and organization. And she did an intervention where she taught students in chemistry classes three different uh, strategies on how to read te chemistry textbooks. They have sequentiation, generalization. She defined those. She taught students how to read it and what happened to their performance. It went up. You teach them organization strategies. Um, now I'm going to learning, organizing, learning and development. Learning and development, we are all in development. And we're going from other support to self-support. This is a big one, and this really is akin to what Tom is talking about in information. We have to learn to reach out to others. A lot of students of color do not want to reach out. OK, let me, yeah, I see. You, you've experienced that. Why don't they want to reach out? Stereotype threat. Negative attributions, you got you with me? Now we have to reach them. It's called recruit a bit, recruiting them to us. Okay, so um, now this is the beautiful one. This is getting into Gestalt. I, I was trained after my PhD at the Gestalt Institute in San Francisco. This is, you see my development? I'm a welfare kid who flunked out of Laney. Everybody hear that? I flunked out of Laney. Why? because I was a Latino kid that didn't know how to learn, and nobody, Tom says he went and talked to somebody about going to college. They didn't even call me. I wasn't even part of that school, really. I had to learn how to learn, and Miss Johnson looked at me, and she said, come on, Mara, you can do this, and she smiled at me, and I remembered Miss Johnson, I went back there. You have to ask yourself, how well do I recruit students to me? And how many of you, honestly, and I want to see honest here, are a little scared sometimes in your classroom that you can't reach out effectively to students? Honestly. Honestly. Beautiful. That's, that's honest. That's task involved. I get scared of my students. I tell them, okay, I'm a little bit scared now that I'm not connecting with you. Okay? But when you hold an infant, how does that infant feel? Safe, secure, what are they releasing in their body? Hormones and neurotransmitters, oxytocin. How many people are familiar with oxytocin? Women have more oxytocin than men, right? It's release of breast milk, but it's also care related to care. So when we care for students, and they feel this is the operationalizing of care, being cared for. What Tom talks about being cared for, you can operationalize it by saying the brain changes when students are cared for and their mirror neurons see that they're being cared for. How do they see it? Just like this and smiling. 
and saying, come to see me in my office hours. I remember a lot of faculty said to me, how do you get so many students? I had 12 to 14 students coming to my study sessions. Now, oh, and I want to relate that to being here on Friday, because I was a, I don't have to do study sessions, do I? No, I don't. Why do I do them? Because I am a professional in the community college. I'm challenging you here. And Tom said, it's great to see you on Friday. BS, I didn't, I didn't want to say bullshit. <laughs> this is our privilege to be here. This is California Community College. It is our privilege to work with the people of this nation. And I ain't jiving. I'm serious. And I'm serious as a heart attack that I almost had in September. <laughs> How many people like that? <laughs> but you see, no, 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 no. Oh, it's great that you're here. It's your privilege, and you should be committed to being here because this is what this is about, serving students and our community. Give me a big round of applause on that. <laughs> big round of applause. Power to the people. Que viva la huelga. Si podemos. Oh, what's going on there? Well, let's find out. Hallelujah. No, no, we're in church. Oh, who said hallelujah? Holly. Uh, Holly. Holly. She said Holly. Holly. Yeah, it does sound a little churchy. People tell me you sound like you're in church. They let me do a, a graduation speech in West Oakland. Anybody ever been to West Oakland? Graduation speech in West Oakland at a church. It was all African Americans. And they gave me a podium up there with the, with the priest talks. And I said something like that. And somebody said, Amen. I said, oh, no, they did not let me in here like that, because then I went to church on it. Why? Because I was raised with African-Americans who gave me so much love that I could cry. And I hate that this society hates African-Americans so much. I hate it. And we are here privileged to change that stuff. Does that make sense? Okay, well, give me a big round of applause. And we need to have more black faces in our faculty. Don't give me no jive that they can't do this. Don't give me no jive that Latinos and Latinas and Chicanos can't be professors in community colleges, because we can. I'm an example of that. At Minnesota, the third top nation in the world, in the United States, only 188 PhDs the year I got my PhD. Welfare kid, flunked out of Laney, I got a PhD at Minnesota. They said I was one of the heaviest theoretical people they saw. But Ms. Johnson, Ms. Johnson, her smile at me reached me. Now you have to ask yourself, zero to 100, how well am I reaching my Chicano Latino students, my veterans, my foster youth? How well do I even know what I'm doing with them? That's professional development. We got it? I'm being a little bit real. This is North Oakland. I got from North Oakland. Okay. But it's a body experience when I trust myself. As a learner, when I, le when I have that learning experience, th th this was Ruth, right? When I have that learning experience, my body feels like relaxed and confident. I'm releasing dopamine, glutamate. Now here's, here's Amy Cuddy too, again. The brain stem releases what two neurotransmitters? Say again? Endorphins. Good. Norepinephrine norepinephrine and dopamine. So here, listen to this. If I walk around like this, uh, cortisol. If I just do this, I will succeed. I promise you I will succeed. I'm releasing dopamine and norepinephrine out of my brain stem. Is that important to know? Do we want students to know that in orientation? Do we want students to know that in our classroom? Yeah, do you like it? I love the smile. But see, this is the knowledge that we want to give them to empower them to be effective. Oh, I love this one. How many times, okay, here. There's a little child learning how to walk. Get this on video. Uh-oh, get this back here now, uh-oh. Okay, get it here, take your time. Okay, so a child is learning to walk, he or she is down on all fours, puts her hand up here, she's never done it before, right? Puts the other hand up, what are they feeling in their body? Excited and what else? Fear. Fear. The same thing that goes in our classrooms. With learning math, with learning writing, we got it? Then the child goes like this, <gasps> <gasps> whoa, there's the only support. 
that may be Miss Johnson looking at me. <gasps> and then the child falls. How many times does the child? Dang, what's well, complicated? How many times does the child fall when they're learning to walk before they give up? How many times? Listen to the question. They don't, right, Rogelio? They don't give up. Why? Because it's built in to stand and feel proud. It's built in. When blind people finish a race, what do they do? They do like this. Where did they learn that? Did they see somebody else doing it? It's, it's evolutionary. We are built to stand. African Americans are built to stand. Damn, I'm angry. Rasa is built to stand. We're all built to be here and learn. White, brown, yellow, red. You got me? We're all here. But you are the leaders. Don't give me no job. You are the leaders that you've got the jobs, the good jobs, that give you the privilege to come here on a Friday. Do people get it? Yeah. Big hand then. I'm serious. I'm serious. It's a, it's a heart attack. Okay, good, let's keep going. So it feels like, learning feels like that. Look at those little kids. They feel, we want to build. Oh, this, how many people have heard of Jimmy Santiago Baca? No, I think people can hear me back there, right? So Jimmy Santiago Baca, he wrote a book called A Place to Stand. He's, he's all over the United States. He was in prison. He learned to read and write in prison just like Malcolm X. Jimmy Santiago Baca, A Place to Stand. It's on the video. You'll be able to get that. And here's what he wrote. He learned to write. But when at last I wrote my first words on a page, he learned to write in prison. How many of our students really are learning to write here? Right, a lot of them. I felt an island rising beneath my feet like the back of a whale. Is this beautiful? This book, A Place to Stand, is a, place, a book we should read too. I had a place to stand for the first time in my life. Is that beautiful? How many people think that's beautiful? Beautiful. Give him a hand then. You invite Jimmy to come and talk. He goes around and teaches uh, Rasa kids and all kinds of other kids, young people, uh, the importance of writing, poetry. We must create places to stand. And this is micro safe climates that Tom talks about. In the orientation assessment, we must give them an experience where they feel like they're standing somewhere that gives them solid ground. Or how many of our students come to orientation assessment leave and say, what was that about? And damn, well, can I even, and how many even don't come back after that? We want to give them a place to stand. In the counseling experience, in the special support programs, in extracurricular activity, foster youth, all those, we want to give them a place to stand leadership programs in our classrooms. We want to develop teaching strategies where students say, I go there and I feel firm. Zero to 100% model of competence, learning, development, and success. Okay, How, who here knows what the word sedulous means? Who here doesn't know? Be proud. Who here is at zero in understanding sedulous? <laughs> this is our students when they come in with what we're trying to teach them, right? The theories, the applications, the, the, the knowledge, they're, they feel at zero. Does it feel good? Not too good, right? And what, okay, so here, we're going to get to know it. It's an adjective. It means painstakingly persevering. How many people get it now? Good. Is this a pretty good adjective? Do we want our students to be sedulous? Yes. Maria, now we want to give it a little bit more knowledge. Maria was sedulous. She never gave up despite the frustration and pain often associated with becoming an effective, successful learner. Who's clear what sedulous means now? That's the zero to 100 in our classroom. Social psychology, definition, proxemics, attraction theory, um, Conformity, this is the theory that got to that. You got it? You see the zero to 100? All learning involves getting more and more information until you understand the knowledge you seek. Here's writing, zero to 100. Now, 
a lot of our students come in. When I went in, I was in basic skill writing. And I've written now, with Tom's help and other people's help, I've obviously done their dissertation, chapters and books. I was a basic skill student. How many people are happy for that, that I was able to learn? This is what we want our students to hear, that they can learn. Too often times we look at them like they can't learn, that's attribution theory, and they're mirror neurons say, I can't learn, and then they're gone. The hormones, the neurotransmitters released don't really work, the fear, the worry circuit, okay? So we want to give them a structure for learning, organization. Here was the fastest man in the United States, Kamarli. To support students' development, we have to recruit them to us. This young man, this young African-American man, told me, he said, Dr. Rivas, I read this, he read Buddha's Brain. He said, I had never read a book in my life, and I love that book. Did I recruit him? And I hugged him, I could cry, I loved him. Kamarli and I cried together. Fastest man in the United States in the hundred. And because our students need us to recruit them. How many people need to get better at recruiting students to you? Very good, good, now we got it. Recruitability, to make meaning with others, we have to recruit them to us. Too many of our students, especially underrepresented students, have lost this ability and result is lack of success in education. Our classrooms are holding environments where we have to recruit our students to us. This young man here, former Drug addict, transferred, we're still in touch, beautiful. I recruited him. Now, can you do what I do? Yes. Can you do what I do? Yes. Can you do what I do? Yes. Well, let me hear it then. Can you do what I do? Yes. Do you want to do what I do? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, recruit people. To, but really be committed. Now, the faculty leadership here, the Senate, Nina's not here. That's why I wanted her to be here. We have to challenge each other to do this. Keegan says you have to confirm students. This is how you do it. We have to operationalize, confirm them. Hey, you're important. You can learn. Look at them. That's confirmation. Come to my office hours. OK, you're not understanding. It's OK, you can do it. I'm here to support you. Confirmation. Everybody got it? Contradiction. That's not effective. You're not doing that effectively. You got it? Was that Holly? All right. <laughs> Continuity. Listen, I got a PhD. Stick with the process. You have to talk to yourself. Stick with me. Continuity. The orientation programs have to say that. The counseling programs have to say that. The foster youth programs, continuity. We're here to be a continuous support system to you to empower you. Stereotype threat. OK, let's, um, there's, stereotype threat is a cognitive experience. I have to slay the ghost in the room. They all think that I'm stupid. What are the stereotypes about Latinos and Latinas, the negative ones? We have any Latinos and Latinas in the audience? Go ahead, let me hear it. Come, what's that? They all have 15 children. They all have 50 children. Beautiful, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, tell me your name. Andres. Andres. OK, what's another stereotype about learning? They don't care about learning. They don't care about learning. What's another stereotype? They're late. They're late. What's another stereotype? What's that? Lazy. Lazy. Right. So now, if. If I'm not, if I'm in the classroom, I'm worried about what people are thinking about me. That's releasing what? Hormone? Cortisol. Cortisol. Now we're getting it right. Now how do we change that? Say again? Use dopamine. Give them some dopamine. <laughs> <laughs> me, I got me a cup of dopamine. Because dopamine is related to coca, you know, cocaine. But yes, that's it. Come on, you can. Sit in your classroom. Listen, come on, stand here with two minutes for me. I love you. Now, can you say I love you to students? Hell yes. I do it all the time. I love you. I love you as a learner. You hear me? I love you. You're special to me. Will that release some dopamine and oxytocin? Yes. Especially if they believe. Ooh, you, you like that, huh? Do you feel it? I do. You feel it. I, Do you I, feel me? Yes, I'm feeling you. I'm Beautiful. Here. I'm, I'm here. Look at that. Now, I'm now you just have to. Well, damn, I must. I probably look stupid if I try that. No, you've got to develop your ability to connect. 
you've got to feel stupid because our students feel stupid in the classroom trying to connect to you as a learner. So you let them know you feel kind of stupid too, but I'm going to connect to you. I'm going to bet wins. I bet because you like that one. That's a good one, huh? I mean, it's, but not all Latinos are avergonzados, but a lot of us are. Here the, here the stereotype threat releases, activates worry circuit, and it's actually ventral anterior cingulate cortex. There's the place in the brain. This is real stuff. Here, you see women with men decrease math scores. More women, less men, higher math performance. Stereotype threat at work. Now you can't bring in, okay, I'm bringing in the test, I'm bringing in 50 African Americans to, to, so you can feel good, no. But you can shift the situational cues in the classroom. Uh, remember, here we have the uh, classical conditioning in the name. A conditioned emotional reaction to my name. Carmencita. Oh, God, he's going to call on me. Look at it. And how many of you had that even here when I looked at you and went to call on you? That is cortisol. That is a stress reaction. Two minutes, good. OK? We, we must change situational clues in the classroom. Ourselves, I am a situational cue. Zero to 100, how many of you are pretty well connected with me right now, honestly? Good. I had to put myself out here to do that. You have to do that with your students. Our classrooms, we have to set up our classrooms so students connect to us. Our college campuses, low ability attributions, there's, how many people need to learn more about attribution theory? I know, good. So here it is, that if I have low ability attributions, that means I think I can't write English well, I can't do English well, I feel shame and doubt, vergüenza. Is that a good learning feeling? No. If I think that English is too difficult to do, or science, this is big in the sciences, you gotta shift attributions. How do I feel? Helpless and hopeless. Whoa, depression. I withdraw. You have to change that, and the zero to 100 is a way of changing it. You're at 40, you only get to 80, this is how you get there in math. This is how you get there in writing. This is how you get there in psychology. You everybody got that? Now, and then when they start moving up, what do they feel? More dopamine, and they feel hope. And they get better, not bitter. And you could say, get better, not bitter. Now, would you kind of look stupid if you were Dr. Rivas? Remember, I'm not African. Get better, not bitter. Come on, you could do it. Damn, look at you. Get better, not bitter. How many people like that quote? Like yes, it. get better. You like it. Beautiful, ain't it? Good. Task versus ego involvement. So now, I'm going to finish up and tell you that I'm only about halfway through Tom and I want to come back. This is, I'm not trying to sell you anything because I'm going to different colleges. I personally, in my last stages of my professional career, want to pick a few colleges, and Tom does too, where we come steadily and we work around important developmental things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm just making that offer. That's it. This is out there. So uh, ego involvement. This is the last one I want to finish. Compare and despair. So when I'm ego involved, I'm comparing. If I'm at 40 and I think everybody's at 95, how do I feel? Shame, despair, anger. I used to go to San Francisco to the middle schools. One of those kids is, in, is finishing his PhD now. And I talked to him one time when he was just in eighth grade. I said, ¿Y, y cómo, se, cómo se siente? Inútil, desesperado, avergonzado. All these seventh grade kids knew the words about shame. And shame is when I reach out and I don't get support, and I withdraw, even, even Corky Gonzalez. How many people know uh, Yo Soy Joaquin? Yo Soy Joaquin, perdido en un mundo de confusión, enganchado en el remolino que es la sociedad gringa. <laughs> That's our ethic out here too often. But no, we're part of Asian. I want Asian love, I want white love, I want brown love, because all of love is learning. Everybody got it? So you got to put yourself out there. And black love, I definitely need me some black love. <laughs> OK, so ego involved. I'm at 40. I'm feeling bad. What happened? Oh, no. There you go. Phew. Task involved. 
40, I want to get to 80, how am I going to get there? Now, in the rest of the talk, and I'll finish now, the rest of the talk, I was going to show more strategies, but you have it about how you move from wherever you are in different, like, memory strategies. How many people are familiar with the jigsaw method? Creating more learn group learning strategies in the class. All those are abilities to release dopamine to create connection for students. So I thank you for letting me give you my love, my little bit of love, and my knowledge. And let's kick some ass out here with the people. Thank you.